and we're live. And we have 20 people already in the room. Uh, hi, everybody. This is Leslie here. Uh, I think we have some members, but probably some people who don't know me. I'm the founder and CEO of the Female Founders Alliance. Uh, I am super excited to bring you today's forum uh, with two amazing women that I was uh, just completely fangirling over uh, before uh, we opened up the room for visitors. Uh, so <laughs> uh, Elizabeth Ian of the Hustle Fund and Tracy Lawrence uh, of Choose. So they're going to tell you a lot more about themselves and uh, and have a conversation with each other. And then we'll open it up for questions from the audience towards the end. So as um, Elizabeth and Tracy are talking, if you guys want to leave us questions in the chat room, um, we will be kind of throwing them at uh, these women, uh, you know, 20 or 30 minutes from now. So uh, please feel free to, to ask away. Uh, there's a lot to learn from, uh, from these two amazing speakers. Thank you guys for giving us uh, some of your time this Friday afternoon. And um, let's, let's kick it off. Why don't you guys introduce yourselves, tell us about yourselves. I am going to turn my camera off so I don't distract people. So you're just gonna see my, my headshot, which by the way, this is my headshot before I had two kids. So just, uh, <laughs> Um, I look equally young and like, <laughs> um, okay, so let's kick it off. Welcome, Tracy and Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you. Elizabeth, you want to start? Sure. So I'll go first. So I'm Elizabeth Yin. I uh, previously was an entrepreneur, or I guess I actually still am, but I previously had an advertising technology company many years ago um, called Launchbit. And then uh, grew that for several years, actually, with my best friend from high school, who was my co-founder, mm -hmm. Jennifer. And we sold that business in 2014. From that point on, I've more or less been an investor, like a professional investor, for the last almost five years. I um, did some angel investing, and I also worked at 500 Startups, where I was a partner there and ran their accelerator for almost three years. And then in the last two years or so, I started a VC fund called Hustle Fund. We invest in quote pre-seed companies. And um, so I've been an entrepreneur again in a different way of uh, running my own VC fund. So kind of entrepreneur turned investor, definitely have a lot of fundraising war stories that we can talk about from raising money for both a VC fund and a product company. And then if you hear noise in the background, I'm, I'm really sorry, actually I'm on a family vacation and you may hear my two children. So, you know, certainly open to questions about, you know, balancing a family and running a startup or a fund or whatnot. So cool. Um, Elizabeth, when we, were we at 500 going through it at the same time? Or no. In the back for really context, I remember. Yeah, so for context for everybody, Tracy and I know each other from the 500 family, um, but we didn't go through it at the same time. I went through in batch mm -hmm. two and I think, Right. You were a few bats right. later, right? But the 500 fine. family is pretty close knit, and so everybody kind of knows each other. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Tracy Lawrence. I'm the CEO and founder of Choose. Um, we, just, my, my way of background, like, we are, so I, I started the company back when I was in college. So this is my first job. Well, uh, which, yeah, oh, totally. I mean, like, I've never had a manager. I was, I was just figuring, I mean, I'm still figuring stuff out, to be honest with God truth. So um, I, I started it, I was, I grew up in LA and I went to USC and when I was at USC, um, I was an event planner on the side. And I, that's when kind of office managers started to approach me and say, you know, I need to do a catering for 30 people and uh, for an all hands and I'm sick of Subway. I was like, all right, we can do so much better than Subway. And I started to work with local restaurants in downtown LA um, and, uh, and and basically doing my first catering order, I realized I thought it was going to be super easy and it ended up being a crazy hassle. I had to call up a bunch of different restaurants. Um, half of them didn't deliver. Many of them didn't accommodate certain nut allergies or food allergies. <laughs> um, none of them had online ordering. Um, and still in the industry, half of restaurants don't offer any kind of online ordering for catering. Um, more than half, actually. More than half don't offer uh, delivery for catering. So I started to realize like technology could automate and solve a ton of this. And um, that's kind of when I started I started my journey. So I was about, I don't know, I guess 20, 21. Um, it's been about eight, nine years now. Um, and, and just as an overview of the company, we 
um, cater family style meals to offices now. We're in five markets. So San Francisco, Silicon Valley, Los Angeles, Chicago, and Austin, Texas. Um, we've raised about $35 million to date. 500 Startups was our absolute first investor, like first $50,000 in. Um, and wow, like it's just been a hell of a journey since then. Um, I'm on my like sixth round of financing. Uh, we have a board member, we have investors. I've got about 300 employees total, 120 of those are full time. Uh, we're based in San Francisco. So there's a, just, yeah, there's a lot that we could dive into on, on fundraising and sort of the journey to being real and authentic in it. Yeah, I think that's amazing. I had no idea about the beginnings of your story. So actually maybe that's a good point where we can just kind of get started. Um, I think the yeah. choose fundraising story is actually very fascinating. Maybe we start there, like, you know, in getting your first check, I think after 500, let's just call it like, what, yeah. what was that first sort of seed round like for you? So, I mean, this was, I, I came, I, I came up to San Francisco and I didn't know anybody except the 500 network. And so I actually spent the first two weeks calling up every entrepreneur that I could through 500. I called 17 founders and I was just like, what do you, how do you fundraise? <laughs> like, what is this asking for money, you know? And um, the founders still, many of those founders to this day are my dear friends. Um, it's what established me. And, and, and I think one thing that I would say for anybody who wants to be an entrepreneur, finding that that founder network that you, that feels really invested in you and that you can build honest relationships. Like they were super honest with me. They were like, fundraising sucks. It's super <laughs> hard. Don't believe any of the stories that they tell you out in tech branch. Like this is a very, very hard thing to do. And it's emotionally, I had an entrepreneur tell me, she's like, it's one of the most psychologically damaging things I've ever done. Yeah. <laughs> like, whoa, you, you know, it's like, shoot, like, and, and I'm so grateful that they were real with me. Um, cause otherwise I would have just read TechCrunch and been like, man, I'm supposed to be like fundraising in a month. And it's like, yeah, <laughs> these financings take like four to six months. Um, and they take up, if not all of your time as a founder, all of your emotional energy as a founder. So I, luckily I had a lot of support from the network. Founders opened up their networks to me and they introduced me to their investors. And one of the best ways that you get, I, I think pretty much the only way that you get a great um, intro to an investor, number one is through an entrepreneur in their portfolio. Number two is through your existing investors who are excited about you. That's it. If your lawyer's making intros, honestly, I would try to just find another channel and not get an intro. You know, did, did you find the same experience? Oh yeah, for sure. Best interests come from entrepreneurs they've already backed. And I think, if you can, if you know that it's an entrepreneur who's doing well, like even better, <laughs> uh, or an, a recent entrepreneur they back, so they're still excited about that company. Right, yeah, actually it's a, that's a really good point. Um, um, okay, so that's I assume how you got your first warm leads and, and got your first checks? Yes. And then what happened after that? Like how did you kind of close everybody else? Because that's a real bear too, right? Everyone will talk to you, but then right. what happens? I mean, and I'll bring it back to like the topic of this conversation, which is about like raising it with heart and authenticity. You know, I felt, man, back to the first fundraise, I didn't, I struggled with like, I mean, I was 21 or 22. I, I didn't really know like who I was, what I stood for. I was really afraid. I was like, oh, I, I had a chip on my shoulder and insecurity about my, my youth actually, about my age. Hmm. And the fact that I had never had any job experience before because you see founders go out and they've got like Google on their resume or Facebook and you're like, Oh my God, they're like, you know, or they're engineers. Right. And I was like, I'm like this, this business student, like undergrad business, not even an MBA. I didn't go to Stanford. Uh, you know, I didn't have any of those pedigrees. And so I felt really insecure about it. Um, but I think the reason that people ended up investing, um, was because I was so damn passionate um, about what I wanted to do and what I wanted to bring into this world. And like for me, Choose is a company that is about bringing people together over food. And the origin stories, which I, I actually don't know if I shared it. I, I don't think I did in this first round, but in subsequent rounds I've shared it. And it's very powerful because it's just real. It's like when I was 10 years old, I was bullied severely as a kid. And I used to go eat lunch alone in the bathroom. And it was like, really? 
I had no idea. Yeah. It was, it was like a horrible, you know, like the girls in, in my grade used to bully me. And, and, and so it's like, there was a very disconnecting experience and it came to a point where, um, I came to realize, Oh my God, like I actually, I actually built this company because I want to make sure nobody eats lunch alone. And that's why we don't do individual ordering. That's why everything is family style. And the point is that at the office, you can sit together, whether you're 15 people or 700 people, that you can sit together and eat and connect. And I think that vision was was a big part of how I sold my first investors. And I was kind of naively, and this served me really well, but I was like sort of naive about it. And I was like, look, like this is, this is what I want in the world. And I had just endless amounts of enthusiasm and passion for it. And what I didn't realize then that I know now is that so many founders burn out around between years two to four. Yeah. They just fucking burn out. And, and so it's like being able to have a mission that you're so enthusiastic about now, it's kind of like the beginning of a relationship, right? Like you go through the honeymoon period right. and that's the, yeah, arguably that might be the best time of your relationship. Right. So if it's not that great, like things are only going to go down. Go down here, yep. You know? And yeah. so at what point did you realize this and kind of iterate on that story? Because the storytelling is so important, right? There are 20 different ways yeah. you could tell that story. Yeah. It kind of depends on the phases. So we've raised series C, A, and B. Um, in, the, in the seed round, it's like, it's a huge part of the story. Mm -hmm. you, you know, and you want it, it still needs to be succinct. Right, you're not. I'm not like going into so many layers of it. I'm. I'm saying like this is the driving passion behind what I'm doing. Here's where I expect it to end up going. Here's how we expect to monetize it, and here's our growth. It's. It's still succinct in there. I think as as we've gone through labor stages, I'll still talk about it. But now people want to dive into the metrics. They want to know sure. the cohort analysis. They want to know the average order sizes. They want to know our gross margins. Um, but it, it took up a larger composition of the early part of, of the fundraisers. When you, you know, I often think that actually call it even the series A, and I don't know if this is true for you, but like the series mm -hmm. A is often very tricky because you don't quite have all the metrics yet. Like it's not clear it's working, working. It's, yeah. I mean, it's on its way, but and not quite clear. And the storytelling is important. And so it's kind of in this weird sort of Goldilocks zone that actually is, neither in the series B or in the seed, how'd you kind of navigate mm -hmm. that? And I think my other question is, you know, there's been a rise and fall of so many food startups. I mean, mm -hmm. did you just kind of get lumped in with everybody else? Like, oh, you know, there are too many food startups. I'm sitting out like, did, like, can you talk about that? Like what happens if you're in a crowded space and when you're kind of in this weird, weird uh, fundraising zone? Yeah. So, so tackling kind of the series A question, um, we, spoke to like 30 VCs. Um, and here's the thing too about the fundraise, you're gonna get so many no's mm -hmm. and it's horribly demoralizing, mm -hmm. horribly demoralizing. And any any founder who says otherwise is lying. Yep. 99% of them. There might be 1% that like really are, you know, like the crazy, super confident people. But like, I also think that privately, they're probably demoralized too. It's just, you get so many no's, right? So we, by the end of it, um, we were pitching Foundry Group. And I had, by this point, we were we were towards the tail end, and I'm like, you know what? I had been hiding a lot of the story that I really wanted to tell. So first off, okay, let me tell you about the Series A. I walked in, and I was kind of emulating one of my advisors. He's a guy, he's like, a really, like, he's, he's got a lot of confidence. Like, it's a dear friend of mine. And I walked in, and I was like, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna be like a guy. Right, and so I wore Converse to the meetings. I cut my hair super short. I was wearing T-shirts. I'm like, I'm gonna be androgynous. Like, no one's gonna know. It's like that. First off, that's dumb. Like, of course they know. Um, I'm not Mulan here, like joining the army. And so, <laughs> freaking walking in, and it was, it was just like it wasn't me. You know, it was inauthentic, and I wasn't super proud of myself and the image that I was trying to portray. So. From, from that stage on, I also like really avoided, I, Choose had really started to grow this culture and that we had started to call a love company. And that means it's a highly emotionally intelligent workplace where you can actually share direct feedback, but with a lot of care. And we recognize that we're building this company to build connection. 
That's the love company. I didn't say any of that to investors because I was terrified. You go into their chic offices in Silicon Valley and they're all wearing their like vests and their blue shirts. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, you're like super expensive offices and it's like, ooh, like these are finance people, you know, like they won't care about this. I think that was the wrong play, actually. And so when I, by the time I got to Foundry, it was later on in the pitches and I had amazing conversations with them. I remember sitting down to lunch and Brad Feld, who's one of the partners there, he says to me, um, tell me about the trajectory of your business and where it wants to go or where you want to take it. And I, I said, you know what? And I, and I decided that moment. I was like, look, if this company fails because I didn't tell my story, I would, I will always regret it. At least if I tell my story and it doesn't work, I'll know. Like I'll know I went for, I went big. And so I, I led and I said, you know what? We want to build a love company. I want it to be a public company that actually is touted as a love company that cares about emotional intelligence and builds better connection in workplaces through food. And I was, I mean, I was terrified on the inside saying all of this. Um, and, and then I talked about the business, right? And I talked about the metrics, but that's where I started. And that, you know, we didn't have it all figured out at the Series A. Like, we still don't have it figured out. We have way more figured out. But we don't have it all figured out. Even, even at this stage, as we approach our Series C. Um, but, but leading with that, at the end of it, um, I get a phone call from Jason Mendelson, one of the other partners, and he's, he's like, where are you? And I'm like in the cafe with my co-founder going like, yeah, this is, we're never going to get funding. Like, <laughs> and, and I'm like, oh, we're in the cafe. He's like, great, I'm coming to you. And he sits down with us and he looks, he looks at us and he's like, you know, he's like, you know what? We're really compelled by your business. We're going to do this deal. What questions do you have for me? And I'm sitting <laughs> there and I'm like, um, uh, so do you take a board seat? Like, I, just, I had no idea what questions to ask. He's like, let me tell you what questions you should ask me. What size is our fund? What stage are we in the fund? How much do we have for follow up? You know, and, and he was incredibly supportive. But I think to bring it back to your question, it's like, there was still a lot of vision. Um, and because, and, and I think as an entrepreneur, you have to remember the things that excite you you have to bring up in the fundraise as well. I mean, there's a balance. Like I'm excited by culture and most, uh, most VCs frankly don't care about it. But like when you get excited, generally investors get excited. So shying away from that and being inauthentic because you feel like they're playing their game is generally the wrong move. And I, and I would, ch I challenge that now, even in myself when I feel that way. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the tricky balances that I found when I was fundraising, um, especially as a first time founder as well with my ad tech company is, um, you know, there's this notion of you want to pitch something that you think will be compelling and that somebody else will like. And you almost there's this you almost want to try to morph your story into what you think they want to hear. But actually, that's yeah. the exact opposite of what you should be doing. Like, even if it's not yeah. what that person wants to hear, it's so important, actually, to have a very strong, differentiated story about who you are, what it is you want mm. to achieve. And even if it means that more people will say no, actually, I think the more bifurcating the story is, the better. Mm. The mm. more differentiating and unique the story is, the better. And that often means that there are going to be a lot of people who actually hate the story. Like, I'm sure, you know, if you had, let's say, rewound the clock, gone back and pitched all these people this story, I'm sure there would also be a whole bunch of investors who'd be like, no, I'm out, it's too no. fluffy, too touchy-feely, right? But then oh. there would be people who would be like, actually, that really resonates with me. That pushes me over the edge to a yes, as opposed to something kind of in between, which is like, oh, this seems, she seems good, she seems smart, but like, not, we're not quite there yet. And then they're just on the fence, right? And it's that sort of middle right. zone where you don't want people to be there. You want them to be like, yes or no. You don't want them to be in this middle zone of where you have to convince people or, or whatnot. Right, and I think you're totally right. It's about being polarizing, which is terrifying. It's fucking right. scary, <laughs> you know? And, and I have found, so I did have an investor uh, in an earlier round who I pitched him and he had spoken to our customers and I met with one of his business partners and we were super excited about each other. And it comes to the day that he's supposed to come on site to meet the team and he calls me up and he says, I'm sorry, but we can't invest. Even though your customers say this is one of the best things that's happened to them at work, even though we're excited about the industry, we frankly, 
think it's going to be a very competitive industry and you're not out for blood. And like, she flat, you know, yeah. and it was like, it was a huge sucker punch to me. I felt yeah. horrible. Um, and it was probably one of the biggest moments for me where I was like, should I be in tech? Like, do I really have to be out for blood? And that's kind of when I realized, like, you know what? I didn't join the military. And he is super right. Like, I'm not out for blood. But that's different from not being out to win. Right. I'm absolutely out to win. Yep. Um, he just had only seen it in a very specific way. And yep. we would have been we would have been a terrible match for each other. So yep. I would have never been the temperament that he would pattern match and expect. But Foundry is an amazing match, and they're very supportive of the way that I read the company. Yep. Two different things. Yep. And that's sort of the other thing as well, which is a good point, which is, you know, I think, you know, having been in that situation before where it's like, oh, my God, like, I just want to raise some money. But like, <laughs> yeah. you, like, you would almost be willing to take money from people who are not a good match, which is like a yeah. short term sort of thinking, like, oh, yeah. I need to bring money in the door today. But then it can definitely cause lots of problems, like even year down the road, a few years down the road or whatever. And I think that that match is so important that people don't really think too much about because the short term goal is just to raise money as quickly as possible. Right. Well, Elizabeth, I'm curious from you. And I know you asked me the food tech question. We can come back to it. But like being now on the other side of the table, do you um, how do you think about the different styles of the way that when founders come to you and they pitch, you know, and there is arguably a masculine or a hyper masculine style, arguably a hyper feminine style, um, some which pattern match, some which don't like, how do you, how do you filter those things out? You know, it's interesting. So when I was at, I'll get to that question in a second, but when I was at 500 startups running the accelerator, you know, we saw regularly tens of thousands of companies. Um, mm -hmm. And then, I was there for five batches. I led four batches and was part of a fifth. So that was about another, that was 200 companies that we accepted. So wow, I've just yeah. seen a lot of companies and all kinds of founders and, and especially mm -hmm. for 500 startups where, you know, we were like very just open to all kinds of founders from all over the place. Like I just saw so many different kinds of founders. And yeah. I think when I first got there, you know, I almost had, a stereotype in my own mind just based on how the industry has kind of implanted thoughts in your head about this is kind of what you look for these are red flags yeah. etc like I'll give you an example like even gender or you know aside um, one of the best founders I've backed a 500 startups company she when we first started talking like actually she had accepted an offer from them before I got there like for the very first batch that I was a part of and mm -hmm. she told me I really hope to flip this company like in the next couple of years. And I was thinking, Oh my God, this is terrible. Like, why did we, yeah. why did we take this company? Because as an investor, you want the longer term big returns. Like just in general, that's not a good idea. Right. And I think just in general, you know, I still, you know, if somebody tells me, Oh, I want to flip this company next year, that's like not a good sign. But what has happened is actually because her business has done well, um, those thoughts have gone away. Interesting. And, uh, wow. and so now at this point, because she's doing really well, she actually can't even imagine selling it. And, mm -hmm. you know, I guess like when mm -hmm. you think about it, the times that you think about selling your company are actually when things are not going well or hard or whatever. But yeah. if things are going really well, like you can't even imagine selling it. Right. Like you would right. maybe want to raise more money. And I think at the later stages, certainly for everybody's knowledge, you can, you know, these days take some money off the table. I don't know if you've done that, Tracy, but sometimes you have the opportunity to do that. Um, so there are ways to make a little bit of money along the way, um, short of selling your company. And so anyway, long story short, even little, you know, rules that investors have about, oh, if somebody says this to you, like, that's a bad sign, right. it may or may not be. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, I've certainly seen that in other ways as well, like going back to the masculinity thing, like I've had a number of founders, especially founders outside of the U.S., um, female founders in particular, like who who don't sell a big vision yeah. and they actually I, under promise and over deliver. And that generally doesn't work well with most investors. Like most investors mm -hmm. discount everybody's story in general because everybody in the industry is overselling. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, people pattern match against people who undersell their story as well. And so I think my biggest learning is just actually um, 
for me, I try to like, I, I try to almost have to read between the lines of what people are actually saying to try to assess like what they actually believe with like, mm -hmm. because I just know that what people verbalize isn't necessarily what they actually believe either because they're trying to sell me a story that they've been told is a good story to sell or mm -hmm. because they don't know the right. quote right things to say and this is what they believe now, but maybe not necessarily five years from now. So it's, it's a weird sort of learning. And I guess the answer is I have almost like opened myself up more to like new ideas um, mm. because of just seeing so many different kinds of founders. Right. I love that. Um, I want to be mindful of time for questions. Maybe I'll, I'll answer the food tech question and then Leslie, we can start to move to, to audience. Yeah, let's questions. do that. Um, so I, on the food tech side, you know, one thing I've learned in sort of the eight years of running the company, but maybe these five years of active fundraising is that the, uh, and, and over that, that five years of active fundraising, you've had the rise and fall of so many companies like Munchery and Sprig, um, mm -hmm. you know, just like companies that were kind of in the space, adjacent to the space, Caviar being acquired, mm -hmm. now being spun out, and Postmates, and Uber Eats, and DoorDash, like there's so much that goes on in the space. Um, and, I, and I actually have been finding that like, you have to stick to your core, and like not be, you as the entrepreneur first, have to just not be as susceptible to what the trends are of the industry. But being aware of them will be very useful in the fundraise. So I try to pull on what's going on in the industry. And if it's positive, I will like sell it as an adjacency. But if it, and if it's negative, like I will go like, and I will not, I will not talk about it. Or I'll be ready to talk about why we're not that. But at the end of the day, the story is kind of the same. It's like, look, we're, we're corporate catering. Like the industry off, basically right now, the restaurant industry is going through a major shift. That's even like the, the biggest shift since drive through ordering. And that's, <laughs> off premise, which is delivery and catering. And catering is the most profitable part of it. Um, and every restaurant now is, try, is scrambling to figure out like cloud kitchens and ghost kitchens mm -hmm. and setting up the infrastructure to, to manage delivery. And it's like, and catering, it's like, that's exciting that now we have this big trend behind us. We didn't necessarily have like the rise of cloud kitchens, but now it's sexy, <laughs> so we can talk right. about it in a way that like investors and people that don't know the industry will get. Um, yeah. But it's the same damn business, you know? And maybe, <laughs> maybe it's something that, like, as an entrepreneur, you sort of see it in advance and you see it early, but you, you know, and then eventually, like, there's a majority market that, like, rides with it, but you just have to have faith and conviction. And that's kind of the vision. And sometimes employees will see it with you and sometimes they won't. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes investors see it and they don't. And, like, that's where you have to have that in crazy amount of enthusiasm and passion to ride you through when stuff feels really demoralizing. Mm hmm. Yeah, 100 percent. I mean, you've seen kind of the rise and then the fall and then sort of we're on the rise again. Right. It's, it, you're the same business. Right. Go ahead, Leslie. OK, there we go. I was I was just warning the team that's all in the room listening to you guys that I'm turning the microphone on. So, um, uh, OK, so I'm going to um, Tracy along those same lines. We have a question from the group. Um, about why you think Choose has been successful in an area where so many food startups have um, have failed or have failed to get uh, traction. Um, how would you think about that? Um, I mean, you, you already kind of part of answered a part of that, but but if you generalize it a little bit more, like why do you think you have gotten this far um, in a field that, uh, like many other fields, is littered with? Um, yeah. So there's the business model and then there's the heart. So I think on the business model side, we are very relative to companies that have to run their own kitchens. Um, we are pretty capital, like pretty light CapEx. So we partner with local restaurants. They run their own kitchens. They hire the chefs. They purchase their own food ingredients. Um, we only manage the ordering platform and the deliveries. So I think we're much more lightweight. Um, that means that we have to raise less capital and that we can scale a lot more efficiently. Uh, I, so, so I think that that's helpful. We're also in the business space. Like we're B2B. We're not B2C, which means that we have higher retention. Our average, uh, you know, our average customer is spending like forty to fifty thousand dollars a year with us. Um, it's a subscription business. And each of those average order values is like eight hundred dollars. 
and higher margin. So where we have consumer, you know, consumer, they're not competitors, but consumer players in the space where they're making negative gross margins, like they're losing $5 for every order, like we're making, you know, a lot more and we're making it per order. So like, I think dialing in the unit economics, the fact that they're profitable and they just grow in profitability due to our automation systems is probably why we're still around. I'd say in the heart of it, like, it, our, this, this is so, there, there's so many variables. And I'm, I'm actually not here to say that like other companies that have failed in the space had bad cultures. I, I don't know. <laughs> um, it was like, I'm, I'm not internal to it. Um, I just think that we've kept really core to our mission. It doesn't mean that we're perfect. It doesn't mean we've had perfect culture. Oh, we've had our host of culture problems um, as we've scaled and a lot of growing pains. But at the end of the day, like we're really bound by a level of service and, and mission. And the, the more that we talk, like we're highly values oriented as a company, which also means that like we have a lot more feelings of the company, which creates actually like higher swings um, in the amplitude of like how people feel, which is a lot to manage. But also the upside is people are polarized by us. They either hate the fact that we're a love company or they love that we're a love company. Um, you know, I've had, I've had people I've interviewed that are like, I don't want to hug my coworkers. I don't want to get to know them on a personal level. Um, and I'm like, cool, we just saved each other a ton of time, <laughs> you know? And then people that are like, oh my God, I'm super bought into it and I want to, I want to add to it. So it's probably a little bit both. I want to echo the unit economics piece. I think one of the challenges with um, this, this startup ecosystem in general is everyone gets kind of caught up on fundraising. And I'd say that VCs in particular actually are not necessarily the best entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. and they have not paid a lot of attention to unit economics. Yeah. I mean, and I think at the end of the day, business is very fundamental, right? Like. Like it's it's hard to execute, but the concept is easy. Like you need to be getting customers for X and you need to be making more than X on a per unit basis. And if you're losing money on a per unit basis, which many of these food companies certainly were, or even some of these other companies like scooter companies, then you have to figure out how do you adjust like the difference between X and Y, right? And if you can't, it's like game over. And that's all that matters. You have to be able to address, you know, adjust X and Y for every single person like individual and i think that paying attention to that rather than the high level revenue numbers or whatever matters the most because that is ultimately what is going to be the crux or the kernel of your business and i feel like that's just something that a lot of people have been missing especially as we've had a bull market over the last yeah. you know call it five to ten years um i think that just there's just been too much exuberance and ignorance around the unit economics. Right. And, and this goes a little bit to speaking about like raising with authenticity. We do not believe in growth at all costs. And there are some founders that do, and they can raise a ton of money off of it. And I hear female founders go like, Oh, I'm so frustrated. Like, you know, one of my competitors raised twice as much as me. And I'm like, yeah, but their valuation is crazy high. They are deeply unprofitable and they're not going to raise their next round. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I think we actually have to be really tempered. You know, there are different strategies, but like for me, it's like I'd rather raise um, reasonable amounts of money, be pro like not be profitable overall as a company because that's not where we are, but like be unit profitable, get our yeah. markets to profitability and know that we have a good business and grow, right? It's not, it's not like grow or be profitable. You have to do both, but it's not growth at all costs, screw profitability. Not, not at this and stage. I'm, I'm not suggesting that startups are profitable like as a whole. Like as, yeah. I think that certainly takes a long time, but like on a unit basis, let's just call it meals. There's a difference between like serving an office, like 15 to 200 meals, that's right. revenue for that food and there's a cost to deliver that, right? Versus for one person, if I personally order a lunch for 10 or even $15, you still have pretty similar delivery costs to deliver that meal to me. So there's a big right. differential in those unit economics, like never mind the other costs of like the staff I have or the office I have just on a per unit basis. What does that look like? And if it's not profitable, you can't make anything else about the business work. Yeah. I'm going to follow up on this uh, line of conversation. Um, and part of this Tracy and I talked about yesterday, and there's also a question, a few questions out here in the group about fundraising. But let me first ask um, 
something that comes up a lot for women founders, which is, am I supposed to double my projections because they're going to be discounted by half? Um, and the specific question that is out here uh, in the chat uh, is about, uh, for Tracy, uh, what do you tell investors about your use of funds, like how you were going to spend their money? But I'd love to kind of hear from both of you, are we shooting ourselves in the foot if we create like a realistic uh, set of projections and put that in our VC deck? How do we approach that? But yeah, my philosophies on this are always updating, always. And, and probably with the stage, right? Because now we've got more predictability in the model than we've ever had. Um, to, let me actually start with the use of funds question because this one's a little simpler. I would actually say um, I can tell you what my use of funds was, but I actually think the more valuable lesson is every fundraising has to have a narrative like a good story. As you go, let's let's say that you know as you go into later stage rounds, um, a lot of the the story is around you know how do you get a market to profitability if you're a geographic based company, um, and so use of funds. You know, a, a good example of tying it, everything has to tie back into that story of, okay, we know how to get markets to profitability. We're going to raise money to just continue to replicate this model in each market, grow it, and get it to profitability faster and faster and faster until we're a billion dollar company, right? It's like really, you know, stupid, simple uh, story. Then use of funds should also funnel into that. So the use of funds for that story would be we're, we're going to hire a bunch of engineers because we need to automate in order to increase our operating margins. Um, now, if my story was all about growth, 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 like in, at the earlier stages, we have a model, we're figuring out margins, we're just going to scale the heck out of this thing. Um, then my use of funds would be, okay, we're going to take, you know, here's the channel that's working. It's SEM. We're going to pour a ton of money into it. That's going to be, you know, 30% or 40% of the use of funds. So I would just say it, it should fit into the narrative and sort of what you want to get out of the next milestone. So where does the fundraising take you? It's going to be, you know, we're going to be 10x what we were in terms of revenues from last one, or we're going to have five profitable markets. That's how use of funds should fit in. Um, on the doubling projections, Elizabeth, I would be so curious to hear your answer on this. Um, my, my sentiment has been, I try to get to, instead of just like working backwards, I mean, there is a little bit of working backwards of like, what would it take for us to be a billion dollar company in X amount of years? Um, you know, okay, we have to be a hundred million in revenues. If we're gonna get a 10X multiple, how do we get to a hundred million? Like there is there is thinking around that, but I, I like to start from the bottoms up and say, okay, based on what we know about how many sales we can deliver per sales rep in a month, um, how many markets we can open up. Let's actually build a model off of that. And then let's build what I call the most aggressive but still realistic model. So the most aggressive but still realistic model. This is different from what you tell your board, right? Your board, you're adding in quite a level of conservatism um, because every month we're being held to that standard. But when you're fundraising, investors actually – my understanding is investors want to know, like, you're shooting for the moon. And so if you, if all of these assumptions were to land, what would that world look like? But, but don't take it beyond those assumptions because then you're lying. Then there's absolutely no world where any of this could, could land like it does unless, like, something comes out of left field, right? But it's like, look, if all my assumptions landed, here's how this business is going to grow. Um, and, yes, I, investors will discount that. Um, I think that is the honest to God truth. Um, you, I think it's more about how you hold it as the entrepreneur. And, and I think it's okay to say like, and here, here's the aggressive, you know, here's the aggressive version. Here's the biggest risk points. If this model doesn't work, if this doesn't work, if this doesn't work, here's where we would land. Like be ready to talk about it, but hold it, hold it with confidence. That, that's how I would play it. So I agree a hundred percent with everything you say. And I think in particular also, uh, given your stage, it's very applicable. Yeah. I would put a caveat around that. I personally believe that if you're at the seed stage, call it pre-seed or seed, uh, maybe post-seed, but definitely if you're in the, those first two rungs, <clears throat> I would actually just push back on the ask of doing a projections. And, mm -hmm. and so this is where it's a bit geography based, like in the Bay area, if you're raising money in the Bay area, there are lots of investors at the pre-seed and seed stages who will invest without seeing projections. Mm -hmm. Um, 
just because it's not what's done. Now, I do realize that outside of the Bay Area, a lot of people do ask for projections. They do ask for five-year projections, which I just find absolutely ludicrous because <laughs> it's obviously not going to be right. And right. It, I find it a weird Goldilocks and the Three Bears problem because you're going to be too hot or too cold. They're not going to be just right. Like, you won't – you'll either seem not ambitious enough or unrealistic. And mm -hmm. so I just don't think you can win. And so I, you know, I think what I've generally advise founders to do, whether they're in the Bay Area or not, if you're at the pre-seed and seed stages and somebody asks you for, let's say, five-year projections, you know, I would probably just say, you know, hey, look, we all know that five-year projections are unrealistic. Um, you know, I want you to be able to have information to make your decision. But, you know, frankly speaking, this is going to be totally inaccurate. And at the moment, my, you know, I just am taking too many fundraising meetings to be able to even address this well. And and I think, you know, the way to create FOMO is less around how big the business is, but rather how quickly the opportunity is going to go. So I think I would say that just for any homework, if somebody is asking you to do a lot of, quote, unrealistic homework, I would use that excuse of, you know, I'm just taking too many fundraising meetings to be able to do this, but I want to be able to get you something helpful. Now, what I do think is fair game, though, is if somebody is asking you about use of proceeds for the year, and what milestones you'll be achieving in, let's call it the next 12 to 18 months with this round. I think that's a very, it's a good question. And I think you should have an answer prepared for it. And for people who are at, let's let's call it the seed stage, uh, hopefully you have done a bit of testing of customer acquisition channels. If you're, you know, a software business of sorts, maybe you don't have all the clear answers, but you do have some semblance of some numbers. You can extrapolate a little bit to Trace's point around building a story of if I put 40% of my money into let's call it Facebook ads and let's say that these numbers hold these assumptions, then I'm gonna get to this X milestone within, you know, call it 12 months or whatever. I think you can build that story and I think that that is reasonable. Of course, I think in terms of like how you play that, I would kind of keep in mind like what the fundraising traction milestones tend to be. So, you know, just, very back of the hand, like a Series A milestone, common Series A milestone is like around 2 million, call it net run rate. So like if you're, you know, a SaaS company, like you are going to be benchmarked around a 2 million run rate for the Series A, you know, plus or minus a bit, depending on your space. If you're, let's say a marketplace company, it's not gonna be 2 million GMV run rate, it'll be your net, like you take 10% or whatever, like, so you, you'll have to multiply that by 10, you'll have to be getting like 20. Now it's not perfect, but just like rough rule of thumb, you know, what does it take to kind of back into that? How aggressive do you need to be pouring money into ads? Now, obviously your ad, you know, numbers that you've learned through some basic tests are not going to hold, but you know, you should just kind of make assumptions based on what you've tested. I was back here practicing my answer to people. Oh, I'm sorry. I have too many meetings. I, um, I can't work on. <laughs> that the yeah. answer I've ever heard. We're all like pooting back here. Um, Along those lines, there are some questions around, um, and I actually get these a lot as well, um, fundraising strategy in terms of those meetings. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to give you two specific ones from the chat room. One is, how do you select what investors to work with? And I guess I would add, can you, or when can you select what investors to work with? So what are some criteria that you think about there? And the other uh, is uh, to Elizabeth's point of creating that fear of missing out to create that, that like this opportunity is going to end soon. So like, do you, uh, is it okay to give a date by which people are going to have to make a decision? Like, how do you get out of the, of the um, friend zone, right? Like, how do you make it happen or, or, or close it? To the investors that you pick. So I'll be very honest. Like it, first it depends on stage. So at the seed stage where you have a lot of angel investors, I, I categorize it in three ways. People talk about dumb money and smart money, and they're like, oh, I want all my investors to be smart money. And it's like, <laughs> nah, yeah. it, you, you don't. I consider it, I think there's toxic money, I think there's average money, and then there's smart money. And you can basically, if you're to distribute it, I would say that maybe 5% of your money is going to be smart money, Nine, hopefully 95% is average money and then 0% is toxic money. Don't ever take toxic money. It's just not worth it. Life is way too damn short. Um, I take plenty of average money and I don't, this isn't like to insult the intelligence of those investors. They're just not actively involved in the company. They give me money, they trust me, and they let me do my thing. 
awesome. 95% of my, um, my angel investors, right? Or even just my general investors. 5% are smart money. 5% they get my industry. You know, one of my angel investors who now sits on my board, his name is Russell Cook. It's like one of my favorite people alive. He invested in our early round. He is um, very smart money. He's worked in the space. Um, and you, you just don't have time to have everybody be smart money. So I'd say like change the expectations. It's not a bad thing to have average money. Just don't take toxic money. Um, once you get to VC level and they're going to take a board seat, then you're looking at something different. I usually look at kind of a role fit and culture fit, just like an employee. So role, like culture fit is very unique to you. You know, who's the person that you want to work with? What are the characteristics that they have for me? I need someone who's like moderate to high EQ, right? That they can talk about like they have some self-awareness, introspection. I start every board meeting with an exercise called if you really knew me. And it's like two minutes per person. And it's like, if you really knew me right now, here's what you would know. You know, I just bought a house or I, which is not true. I'm just giving an example. I just got a puppy. Um, I, you know, like we, I require a little bit more vulnerability than the average per CEO. I imagine them at their board meetings. So that's the kind of board member I look for. That's on a culture fit side. And I would write it out. I draft out a very short version of it, just like I would for a job listing. And then on the role fit side, I mean, I do think that you have to be I tend to prefer investors who, uh, frankly, have a track record or have been there for a while, and not because of the track record, but because they don't have anything really to prove. This is what I love about Foundry. Like my investors, they're like they're freaking proven, um, and so they're not here to like fight and say like, oh, I need to prove to all these other LPs that are like my my uh, fellow VCs that I'm great. They're just here to help the company. Um, so that's how I would think about the split between. Them. The kind of investors that you want, the ones that you, you don't want. I'm 100% agree. Um, but I want to uh, just follow up really quickly because there's a there's a follow up on the chat. Um, how do you define toxic money, and and more importantly, how do you know when money is going to be toxic? Mm. I had a toxic money investor, and that investor I didn't know was toxic until after they joined the round. So. The, I think the and the thing that I tried to do to mitigate that was I did reference checks and I did three reference checks and, the, and they were fine. Um, so sometimes you can't help it, right? I, that investor had a really good brand name, um, a really excellent brand name and uh, just ended up being really, really toxic to us. So, I mean, if you can try to do reference checks and do back channel reference checks, that means references that they did not give to you that you know have worked with them and that you can get more intel on, especially if they're going to be a major investor. But when you're signing up a bunch of angel investor checks, you don't have the time to do a bunch of back channel references. So honestly, it's very likely that in your fundraising, you're going to have one or two toxic investors. Um, that's why it's even more important that you have some really smart money investors who can help you manage any toxic money investors. Just try to be really cognizant of investing more time into doing your research with, with them um, and hearing how they act with uh, other entrepreneurs that they've invested in if they're spending, if they're going to own a higher percentage of their company. Building on that, I think there are some smaller signs that may or may not happen. So one of my portfolio companies, for example, was talking with an investor who was very interested. That investor called them every single day, like during the fundraise period. Mm. Uh, that is a sign, and I basically was like, it's not worth it. Like, if this person calling yeah. you every single day before being an investor, like, imagine what will happen afterwards. So that's, you know, just little signs like that, how they treat other people, maybe at a, a restaurant or whatnot. Um, little mm. signs like that can can lead to bigger things. Uh, like that's one thought. Yeah, I mean, I think the the other thought is around whether they've invested before and whether they're mm. really comfortable with the asset class of their new angel. So this is more for angels. Than funds, but it can apply to funds too. There are a lot of new funds, right? Who, people who have not invested before, they may not understand this asset class and that you have to be patient and that things look really bad most of the time uh, before they look good. And so, if they don't like, if they don't understand that, we've had a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with every single investor, whether it was for um, Hustle Fund or Launchbit, like who is new to the asset class or relatively new. Like we've said, like, look. You know, we understand that you're new to this asset class. Want to make sure that you're really comfortable with it because actually in most cases you will lose all your money hmm. and you have to be fine with that. And if that makes you uneasy, this is probably not a good fit. 
And addressing that actually straight up beforehand um, is really helpful. Um, yeah, so I guess the second question about FOMO. Yeah. So I think FOMO is really hard to create when you are first starting any raise, whether it's your seed raise or your A or, or your B, because you have like no traction on your fundraise. And so the, you cannot actually credibly say, well, my raise will be over in three weeks or even three months because you just don't know and you don't want to shoot yourself in the foot. And I've seen so many people shoot themselves in the foot because fundraising takes a freaking long time. But what you can say is you can talk about your fundraise process. So I really encourage everybody to actually pack in their meetings. So ideal scenario is you start planning out your fundraise weeks in advance. Like start getting meetings on the calendar for like three weeks, four weeks out, and then pack them together as closely as you can, allowing for commute time or overages or whatever, um, so that you're doing like four or five meetings every day, if not more, uh, for for weeks on end. So you should be getting a lot of intros or doing a lot of cold emailing to, to fill up your calendar. And then you can credibly say to people, you know, when they ask, well, when are you looking to be done with your race? You can you can just say, well, you know, I don't. I don't really know, but I'm back to back in meetings this week and next week. I'm starting to go into second meetings uh, next week. So I'm not really sure, but this seems to be moving fast. And then let them kind of use their imagination of, oh, is this going fast? Um, I think at some point when you have enough warm leads, like where you've had a lot of second conversations, then you can really start to kind of rope people in. So initially you want to kind of corral them in. Like if you think of them as sheep, you want to start to corral them. But at some point you have to kind of like pull the pull the lasso or whatever. And that's really when you've had enough meetings with different people who still seem warm to really, you know, think through, okay, if I'm trying to raise, let's call it a million dollars. And if we just kind of guesstimate how much everybody would do, do we have certainly more than a million dollars of interest? You know, let's say three, four or five million dollars of interest such that you feel like you can take the risk and say at this point, tell everybody at this point, you know, we have about, $5 million of interest. Um, and we're really just trying to wrap this up. Like if you're still interested, can we hop on a call in the next 24 to 48 hours and then, you know, get to a decision by this date. And then I think at that point, if you have enough warm leads then you can put down a date, but I wouldn't put down any dates. So like when you're at the beginning of the raise at all, like use your momentum of meetings as the, as the driving forcing function. And just to add, um, if you're raising a seed round and you're raising on a convertible note, this is different if you're raising an equity round. I, I never had an investor commit and not wire. And I think the reason is I was relentless about once they committed that they were in for the round, um, I would then say, great, I have all, here's all the wire information. I need you to wire um, within the next 24 hours. And I would send them an email pretty much every day uh, thereafter until they wired the money and nobody did Nobody did not wire the money. Yeah. So I would say, like, don't be shy about it. It's like, great. Um, so excited to have you in. And then just have a template email. And I like, I, you know, I'm like a people pleaser. Like, asking for money is not the easiest thing, right? But once you have it templated, all you have to do is click send. So lower the resistance, like the emotional resistance to it by setting up templates and then just click send all day, every day to get that money. One more thing I would add to that. Okay. I have had somebody not wire any money, so like the learning there is soft commit is not a commit. Like, but did they sign? Did they legally sign? No, they they uh, they were very 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 committed up until the paperwork came in. So in my book, verbal commits are not commits. Not Just commit. Yeah. It only happened once because then I learned that verbal commits are not commits. But to Tracy's point, Tracy's point, I've never had people sign and not wire. So that's pretty high. It's still not money in the bank, but it's, it's I mean, they're legally bound at that point. Um, yeah. But one more thing I would say about adding FOMO, and this is kind of complicated, but read my blog, uh, which is, you know, if you're raising, let's call it a big chunk of money, a million dollars, it's hard to get momentum on a million dollars. One thing you can do is kind of break it up into tranches. And I love the tranche strategy, which is, all right, maybe you create a tranche of 300,000 on a convertible note or a safe or something at this cap. And you tell people like, you know, this is how much I'm raising just to get started, just to hit these milestones or whatever it is. Um, and once I hit that, you know, the valuation is only going to go up. So, you know, if you really, if you know you want in now, like I would encourage you to to come in on this smaller tranche, and that's another way to kind of increase FOMO by 
by using a smaller tranche of money. Um, it's funny, my team here, we're <laughs> normally these, uh, these um, forums that we run around the 45 minute mark, we just see like everybody dropping like flies, but, but today everybody's still on there and engaged and still asking questions. I still have questions coming in for a back channel, so there's like a definite formal situation happening even as we speak. Um, this has been amazing. Oh, uh, FOMO is fear of missing out. Uh, somebody just asked on the chat. Um, oh, I'm sorry. And also a you know great tactic to use if you want to corral investors. Um, oh yeah. So you guys, Elizabeth Tracy, uh, this has been an absolute privilege and super super fun. I we could literally keep you guys here all day. I want to know. <laughs> We're gonna try to get you guys to do this again. Um, everybody who joined, thank you so much. Uh, I want to make one shout out. We are uh, putting out a Founders Challenge um, for all FFA members. If you're not a member yet, um, go to our website and find out about it. And it's actually open to non-members. There's no cost. Uh, we want to help everybody um, move quickly and learn how to pivot quickly. So we're putting out a Founders Challenge. I hope that more people can participate. So I'm just kind of teasing it out right now. Um, we have a ton of content and help along the way. So if you want to join us and do it all together, um, subscribe to the newsletter, come online. I also definitely want to recommend Elizabeth's blog. I was telling her earlier, I've been reading it for a long time. Um, and you're like the whisperer, man. Like, oh, so helpful. That was really gendered, not man, woman. Um, just an incredible amount of value without ever uh, actually meeting you. Uh, I've been a big fan uh, of your journey. You. And Tracy, um, I am a hugger too. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. You can make it happen. You can make it part of your company culture. It's not impossible. <laughs> well, I, the, the one thing that I wanted to uh, to get into that we just don't have a lot of time to get into, but we have three minutes, so I want to make the last question for you, Tracy. Is okay. that idea of, uh, of a culture? Because um, on the one hand, you want to have that intensity and that love. On the other hand, it really is a marathon, right? Like you really want to create a team that doesn't burn out quickly. So tell us your top tip for creating a company that will prevail. We have two pillars, which is love and excellence. I think probably the biggest intersection of those two, like the, you have to change your mentality to believe that the two are not mutually exclusive, that you, that you have to sprint in order to succeed. I think you can marathon and succeed. And the biggest value that helps us do that is this one value of being direct with kindness. And it's like the more that you can lay it straight, and I think my COO does a really good job of it, he's like, being direct is kind. So the more that you can actually link those two things and like being, performing is kind. Performing is good. Um, there's no like, oh, you know, demanding. Because when you demand the most out of someone, that actually shows that you care for them. And But they won't actually perform to that high standard unless you care about them. And it's a conversation. You know, it's a constant conversation about are you pushing too hard to the point where it's beyond kind? And then, like, what's the real motivation behind that? Is it because you're afraid? Like, look, you don't want to act from a fear place. That's also not good for the company either. So I think it's a constant conversation, um, but those two can absolutely coexist. You just have to build it into your values and build it into, like, the founding team and the executive team and hire for it religiously. Yeah, I, I actually have that mantra, too. Clear is kind, even though it's really hard sometimes. I like that a lot. Yeah. All right. Um, Elizabeth Tracy, this was such an honor and privilege to have you guys. I'm a bigger fan than I was even before we started. Here's that. Um, thank you so much. Everybody, we'll do this again. We have another forum coming up soon. Um, thank you for giving us an hour of your time and um, have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for, for having us. us. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.